On this week's episode of the Gems of History podcast, we discuss the man who was brave enough to stand up to the most influential and timeless empire in history, Hannibal Barca, who at an early age swore to always be hostile to Rome, is still considered one of history's most extraordinary generals. He, along with the barbarians of Gaul and Iberia, launched a campaign that would include one of the deadliest days in human history. Suki is one of the most feared generals now. Honestly, I've thought many a time about getting her a little like historical for our Patreon. That'd be a great idea. A well, notebook or a notebook, a calendar of like that would Zuki awesome. dresses different. Let's write that down. Write that down. Write that down. Write that down. And then when Viv is here, two dogs. We get reenact Julius getting stabbed. <laughs> Sorry, Viv. You got to take you, the fall on that one. Give Zuki a knife. <laughs> knife. <laughs> It's like the old vine, like, what do you have in your hand? A knife! <laughs> Gems of History podcast hosts get arrested for animal cruelty. Right. PETA's going to be on our ass. Eh, if they aren't already. They also did not like the episode of Dogs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but welcome back to the Gems of History podcast. I'm your co-host, Evan Roosh, and joined with me, as always, our main man with the plan, not named Stan, Jacob Shop. My name is definitely not Stan, that is for sure. I don't know if I have a plan. I also don't think we've ever confirmed that your name is not Stan until right now, so I'm glad we got that out of the way. (laughs) I mean, we've always introduced me as something other than Stan. Jay Dizzle. It it, it could be assumed, I guess. (laughs) Sure. But, hello. We have a really special episode for everyone today. We're taking a little bit of a throwback here. Last, uh, pretty much all of our episodes, or majority of the episodes in last month or so month and a half have been more modern if you will in like those 1900s era this week we are covering carthage and hannibal back in time back in time (laughs) way going way back if you were mad saying oh those hooligans they only cover modern stuff they think again It's not even history, because there's still people that alive that remember it. We're like, going, oh, okay. <laughs> we're going all the way to the BC times. What does that stand for? Before crunch wraps. <sighs> that is true. Yeah. That is a fact. And a lot of the sources now say BCE, and I don't know what the difference is. I think that's... Before crunch wraps were everywhere. Yeah, before... before <laughs> <laughs> the were is in parentheses. <laughs> before crunch wraps with eggs. So before Taco Bell breakfast. <laughs> yes, okay. Now we're getting the idea. Yeah, I know like BC is before Christ and BCE I think is like before... What like, does BCE I think it's like before for? Christ existed. Before the common era. Oh. Before so not Christ, crunch wraps. Before Christ existed. <laughs> <laughs> that also works, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> On this episode, we say the same things twice. But So yes, not Taco Bell related, but we are going back to ancient Carthage, as Evan mentioned. Yeah, really excited about this one. Hannibal is a... I think a lot of people do know who Hannibal is, whether it's... Or like that name means something. And it's mostly not, for the serial. Yeah, it's not from uh, Silence of the Lambs or... Uh, Hannibal Burris. Oh, yeah. For, uh, the the comedian. comedian. We're not talking about either of those guys. <laughs> yeah, Hannibal was just an insane leader of men. Yeah. Like He will cover it all today, from his upbringing to his early start in becoming a general, to also cross- crossing the Alps with tens of thousands of men and war elephants. Yeah, if there's anything you've ever heard about Hannibal, it's probably in the history book as Hannibal crossed the Alps to fight the Romans with elephants. Which is... It sounds like something straight out of Age of Empires. Yeah. Or like a strategy game. Like, that That, ne- that didn't happen in real life. Oh, nope, yeah. It, it did. It did. <laughs> and everyone's just like, Hannibal was a madman. Yeah. And he was like 26, 27 when he did this, too. Like, he was, yeah. at this time, in his middle... This he's dude, having a midlife crisis first. This dude the, lived to almost 70. Yeah. And, like... Before, before crunch wraps. Before crunch wraps. <laughs> <laughs> which is insane. So, yeah, he, he's a kind of a badass. For sure. For sure. And we're going to get into some fun, like, ancient magical stuff. Oh, dude, this time period is so much fun. This is the... It's so whimsical, but everyone's killing each other at the same time. It's whimsical, fun, and also 
And also, a lot of the times, it ends with, but we actually don't know. But with this, we actually have two pretty good historical figures, or I guess I should say historians, that provide a lot of the information. Yeah. One is a little bit more, like, Iliad-ish, if you will. Like, more hyperbole, exaggerated. exaggerated. Um, but no, to be a lot of fun. Yeah, so as Evan mentioned, the main sources that we get Hannibal's story from in the ancient times come from Polybius and Livy. I think it's Livy, Livy yep. or Livy. Um, but they're both Roman or Greek. So, I mean, you're taking the winning sides story for it. Mm-hmm. But Rome really did revere Hannibal for his abilities as a general. And they put statues and stuff of him up in the city after he died. So they did revere him as like, this guy was good. <laughs> it's kind of a game respect game yeah. moment there. <laughs> well, they, he kind of set them up to become what they became yeah. eventually. So, I mean, you got to give him props for that. It always blows my mind whenever we try to grasp the Holy, like that, the Holy Roman Empire, but just the Rome as a whole. Pretty much for the last 2,000 years, a majority of that time, Rome was a hotbed of power. Oh, yeah. Meaning, like, the ancient Roman Empire, like Julius Caesar, the Byzantine Empire, the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire. Yeah. <laughs> like, Literally, 200 BC to 1500s-ish, Rome was, like, it. Yeah, that's 1,700 years of history where they just kind of held the mantle. Granted, it moved to more of like Germania and stuff eventually mm-hmm. once the Holy Roman Empire came around. But still, putting your label on that his- that much history is crazy. Which also makes me LOL. Last year, I think this is the time where it was going a little viral where this TikToker was saying that Rome actually never existed. <laughs> like ancient Rome never existed. Yeah, that's just... Just blatantly, obviously not true. <laughs> like, you can just go outside pretty much anywhere in Europe and be like, yeah, that's like, like a road that was started by Rome. Flat earthers, I kind of understand a little bit because it's like, go you, on. With your eyes, you can't <laughs> see, like, you can't see straight across or whatever. I yeah. don't know. But, like, how do you not accept that Rome existed? <laughs> like, that is more hard to believe on your side than flat earth. Which is saying a lot. Right. Like Rome to not be, I know I'm very dramatic, but Rome pretty much is the history book. (laughs) For a long period. For, I need to back up, for like European, Mediterranean history. Like they are the history book. (laughs) It's crazy. For an entire continent and pretty much a continent and a half. Like there's a decades long section where it's just Julius Caesar telling us what happened in the world pretty much. Yeah. So, yeah, they were kind of important. Mm-hmm. And I, I told Evan this before we started, but the the section of history we're going to be talking about for Rome in this episode, I like to think of it as the Giannis era Milwaukee Bucks because I was trying to relate it to something that I understand. So it's kind of like at first, it's a bunch of city states, you know, no one's really standing out. And then they finally start gaining power. They get a little better. They're climbing the leaderboards in the east. And then eventually they get to the first Punic War. They technically beat Carthage. That's the COVID season. They go into the COVID bubble after the first Punic War. They're riding high. They get in there. Then they kind of have to fight Hannibal. Mm-hmm. And then, so the, then the rest of the season ends. And then we get to the championship year. And then they win the Second Punic War, and then Rome is Rome. <laughs> and Evan's crying in the streets of Milwaukee. It's, <laughs> yes, it really right. Yes, Rome finally won. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> screaming, "We are the champions!" Which is ironic because Giannis is Greek. Oh yeah. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> weird analogy, but it works for me. I loved it, and a lot of people, our local audience, definitely loved it. Yeah, I would hope someone understands what I just said. So, <laughs> but without a don't without, worry, I'm I'm always here for you. I <laughs> always you. understand. If, if nothing else, I have that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, should we get into this? Absolutely. Hey everyone, Jacob from the Gems of History podcast here. And before we get too far into the episode, I want to tell you about Anchor. If you've ever been listening to our show and wondered, hey, how can I make a podcast for millions of people like those guys do? Then Anchor is the perfect answer. If you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, it's the easiest way to make your own podcast. 
Anchor has all the tools to allow you to bless those waiting ear holes with the ability to record, edit, and upload your show from a computer or even on your phone. Once your episode is ready to go, Anchor will distribute your show for you to some of the biggest platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. And best of all, Anchor is completely free to use. So even if you make hundreds of thousands of dollars like us, you don't have to spend any of those profits on making great content. To get started today, simply download the Anchor app on your mobile device or hop on your computer and go to anchor.fm and begin your journey into the podcast world today. Before we even get into Hannibal, kind of set the scene as we do, let's get into how Carthage itself began to even influence this section of the world at the start. So if you don't know where Carthage was, which most people probably don't, it's located in modern-day Tunisia, which is on the northern coast of Africa uh, on the Mediterranean Sea. And Carthage at the beginning actually was a huge rival for Rome because Rome, as I mentioned, wasn't really the Rome we know it as. It's a, they're finally starting to take over a little bit as one of the emerging city-states in that section of the world, which is now Italy. But they had to deal with like the Spartans and all the Greeks and then finally establish themselves a little bit. And then Carthage shows up. Yeah, Carthage is super interesting at the start, like the way that they're civilization gets brought up like they did have a different don't want to say class system but they were very merchant heavy right like they had an incredible seaport which accounted for a majority of their income and so like the merchants like had a huge say in everything where rome was more of that republic army facing i would say yeah uh carthage is very much focused on their trade so Before all the war and conquest that we'll talk about later, Carthage was, as Evan mentioned, just a humble city based on commerce. According to the legends, Carthage was founded by a Phoenician queen named Alyssa, but she is more commonly known as Ditto. I don't know how the name came about. That is the best thing about ancient names. Like Sometimes they sneaky just apply to modern day, like Alyssa. A completely (laughs) different name, too, like Alyssa to Ditto. Yeah. It's either Ditto or Dido. It's spelled D-I-D-O, so I don't know which one it is. We're going to call her Ditto because it's funnier and it's a Pokemon. Yes, Um, (laughs) correct. (laughs) But her claim to founding the city of the founding of Carthage is debated. Since the sources are mostly secondhand or way further down the line from when she would have existed, but the founding of Carthage fits the time period that is associated with her, uh, which is around 800s BC. The story goes, after fleeing her brother in Lebanon, Ditto founded a city on a hill known as Birza. The chieftain of the people that was originally there, who were known as the Berbers, told Ditto that she could have as much land as a single ox hide would cover. So you're thinking, not a lot of land. But you know what she did? She cut that single ox hide into super thin strips and laid them end to end in a circle around the hill and then claimed that for her people to settle on. You have to love... Manip- like she was also maybe the first lawyer. <laughs> like, <I'm> right. <laughs> <laughs> like technically, sir, you said... Just one, and technically, this I also is just love one. that this is like a bridge troll legend, almost like where it's just like, oh, she cut the strips, or this is uh, like the princess who had the pee under her mattress, so they just kept stacking more mattresses. It's <laughs> yeah. like, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> that is honestly great, but to go back a little bit to the founding of it, it is very interesting because it was a Phoenician queen, Phoenician. Of Phoenician, thank you. Um. If you remember our Sea Peoples episode, this is also like just like the Sea Peoples reign was more like 1200 to 10, 1200 to 1000 BC. So if this is like 800, like it's a little bit off. But a lot of the sources actually say that the Phoenician got at that time. Yep. Uh, people were actually a huge um, or are credited with being like the Sea Peoples. Yeah. And a, Which, if you want a recap of that, just go back and listen to that episode. And a bunch of them like went and settled other places. They kind of just disbanded whatever the Sea Peoples actually were. So it could have been that she was part of that. So It's very interesting that, like, yes, and also Rome and Carthage just set up colonies all over the place. Yeah. So they were original co- colonizers, if you will. They were expanded. According to the Roman Purit... Purit? 
According to the Roman poet Virgil, most of our recollections of Carthaginian history is from Roman sources, as I mentioned. Ditto was a very impressive leader and grew her little hill community that she got from her loop of oxides. I guess you could call that a loop hide in the, uh, in the rules. Uh, she grew it into a metropolis of trade. And by the 4th century BC, the little port city where Phoenician traders stopped to resupply and repair their ships had grown into a major trade center in the Mediterranean. Uh, a lot of their growth is actually thanks to another huge guy in history. Uh, look, maybe, maybe you've heard of him, Alexander the Great. Because hmm. uh, he was conquering a bunch of other places, and many of the people in the areas that he conquered ended up in Carthage. And the reason this is important is because Alexander the Great gave these people pretty much a... Uh, what am I trying? A compromise, mm. saying like, hey, if you pay me a bunch of money... I'll let you leave instead of killing you. Mm -hmm. So the people that left and went to Carthage were the wealthy people. So they brought all of the money that they still had after paying off that, that compromise with Alexander and brought it to Carthage and started bringing their know-how and trading and everything to this new city. A weird reallocation of funds, if you will, yeah. for the people of Carthage. It's like, oh, now there's new rich, rich people. Once it was flourishing, Carthage extended offers to nearby tribes in northern Africa to fight in the Carthaginian military and began filling its ranks with the formidable Numidian cavalry, which will be important later. And that added to, in, in addition to their huge commerce presence, the merchant presence, they now had an actual military presence that they were starting to build in the Mediterranean. Always have to have people to, to, to defend your riches. For a government, Carthage was run as a republic around the 4th century, and it was run by two judges who worked together with a senate of two to 300 lifelong members, and they would all propose laws and other measures, and then a citizen assembly would vote on those laws and measures. So it's kind of cool that there's actually a pretty democratic say in how things are run at this time period for this section of the world. Yeah, that is very cool. And it also, in a way, imitates Sparta. Remember how they have the two king system and yep. also like an actual Senate, if yeah. you will, uh, for lack of a better word. So there was some democracy going on Hell in yeah. multiple places. It's very funny that we still say that we were the first people to do it. <laughs> yeah, right. But <laughs> modeled it. <laughs> yeah, modeled it. Yeah. Outside of the government, the trade really was the center of attention in Carthage around this time period. The city's harbors would boast 220 docks surrounded by a half circle of polished columns and arches decorated by Greek sculptures. So that's what welcomed you when you would sail into Carthage. Yeah, the artists, I definitely recommend, I'm sure we'll share them on our social medias, but definitely recommend looking at like artist renderings of it. It is unbelievably beautiful it looks freaking awesome it is so cool and again bc before crunch wraps <laughs> like that impressive of a dock and it's insane and it's also very easy to defend yeah if you think about it in that perspective but also looks pretty so kind of best of both worlds so one harbor in this area was used for trade and the other one was used for warships incoming and outgoing. So they managed their own there and also repaired and resupplied other warships that would come in. So they were pretty much just like the main hub for anything seafaring in the Mediterranean, which is going to get them into a little tiff with Rome eventually. So with them being the main seafaring hub in the region, they had the best navy, as is to be expected. So it that kept not only their trade ships safe, but also helped them to conquer areas to get more resources. But again, like with that Navy, that's how they were able to establish different colonies on all the Mediterranean islands, which you'd be shocked how many different islands there yeah. are in the Mediterranean <laughs> to monitor, set up forts and bases. So having that powerful Navy is extremely crucial for Carthage's success at yeah. this time. And all of the sources are like, oh, they went to Sicily. It's like, I know that one. Yeah, hey, and they're it's like, the boot. <laughs> oh, and Sardinia. Like, hmm, maybe I've heard of that one. <laughs> yeah, that's when you bring out your big old map. <laughs> My atlas. <laughs> yeah. So while seafaring was the talk of the town, Carthage was also no slouch when it came to agriculture. 
with one writer who is known as Mago, completed a 28-volume work on agricultural and veterinary sciences, considered to be the best of the time period. And I believe that it probably was because it was one of the only works that the Romans spared during their eventual takeover. So Carthaginians planted fruit trees, grapes, olive trees, and they ran huge rings of gardens that were irrigated by small canals. So they're really ahead of their time as far as farming goes, having like irrigation systems and everything. Right. I mean, just making the best of the land that they're given, that they got via oxide. Yes. <laughs> it's just very interesting how they truly seem at this point by far the more advanced city compared to Rome. Like right. Rome will definitely get there, like you mentioned uh, with the Bucks analogy. But like Carthage is super, super interesting and just had there's just like a lot of brain power going on oh, yeah. within those walls. Big brain moves. I think that Rome can be compared to Japan in a way because oh, they're that's actually great. That's just great. With how intense they are about everything. Yeah. And that intensity propels them into how they eventually take over everything. Cause they just nonstop are going for the goal. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Like that intensity when you do that parallel, especially with warfare and the military, like focus, like Roman legions, you, I forget the actual name of it, like the Latin name of it, but you could just, they could just decide to like wipe out a legion or a battalion and be like, we didn't like how you guys were doing. <laughs> yeah. And everyone else would be like, yes, this is correct. <laughs> <laughs> they were slouching, you know? Yeah, this is the way. <laughs> Carthage's abundance eventually brought greedy warlords looking to take advantage of it. For example, one man named Agathocles of Syracuse, which is on the island of Sicily, attempted to take over, take over Carthage to use their money and food stores to fund and feed his armies, but the workers in Carthage sided with their employers and pushed out the invaders. So it's kind of very it's very telling that the people that are working for the Carthaginians at this yeah. time respect them enough to protect the land that they're working for them. Which is very interesting again at this time where you typically get into like a lot of like the slave trade or stuff like that, where just there's no rights for people who don't have money. Yeah. And they decided to still just like stay with the Carthaginian uh merchants. Class. Must have treated them well. But just across the Mediterranean, a little startup colony called Rome was getting antsy and wanted to start proving their worth in the Mediterranean as well. Oh, look at the little baby Rome. Wee, wee, wee. <laughs> <laughs> we want power. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm actually going to need that in the Latin, if you could. <laughs> <laughs> the dead language? Please. Yes. <laughs> so to do this, Rome took part in a war on the island of Sicily. Sicilian forces on the island had been divided, and Rome decided to back the northern faction, while Carthage backed the southern counterpart. For a while, Rome wasn't really a threat to the Carthage navy because they were just way more advanced in seafaring than the Romans were, so it didn't really come to blows for a while. But eventually, Rome wanted to end the Carthaginian stranglehold on trade, and they brought the conflict to actual war. This war would come to be known as the First Punic War. I have a hot take, and I need you to correct me if I'm just being silly here, but this definitely makes me think of, or excuse me, this definitely makes me think that this is the first proxy war, if you will, kind of like the Cold War. Yeah. In a way, like, like let's say Rome is Russia, the U.S. is Carthage, and we're fighting over a land that neither of us are really <laughs> pretty we're much. fighting over Vietnam. In this case, it's Sicily. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting. That just crossed my head. History repeats itself oh. in that way yeah, all, all the, the time. time. Yeah. Where are these two completely, I shouldn't say random, but let's call them relative superpowers in the area. Find this little piece of land that's like, ooh, there's some good resources. We could maybe do a little... A little something something be good for trade. How could we prove our worth without giving up any of our land? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> oh, go to a neutral site. <laughs> go to a neutral site. <laughs> it's, what is this, the NCAA tournament? Yeah. Like, <laughs> they're like, meet us in the gym. And the gym's uh, just Sicily. <laughs> the Sicil Sicilians are also just like, 
Dude, oh, huh? <laughs> from here until like they the end of the time. Middle Ages, it's just like, let's go fight in Sicily. <laughs> they have a rough time. And that also bred the Sicilian mob. Go listen to that episode series. It's so, <laughs> it, it, the Sicilians do carry that grudge with them because uh, I worked at a car dealership for a little while. And one of mm-hmm. our shuttle drivers was a Sicilian. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, we're going on a vacation. We always go to Sicily. And they're like, they, they identify mm-hmm. very strongly with being from Sicily rather than being Italian. That is really interesting. So it still it carries on. Well, it's like Texans say that they're from Texas. <laughs> they like the fact that they're from Texas. They love a good old yeehaw. So the First Punic War, Roman forces pushed the Sicilian island and forced the armies of Carthage out of the landmass of Sicily. So basically, Rome promised to protect those in the northern part of Sicily, and Carthage resisted that and were defeated. But Rome had to pull about half their forces out pretty soon after, and this bolstered Carthage's resolve to go and continue the fight on Sicily. Rome was winning most of the small skirmishes, and when they would win, they did treat some of the cities pretty harshly, like raising them to the ground pretty much. But since Carthage still had sea superiority, they wouldn't go away completely. At this point, the Romans pretty much knew that they needed a naval presence to truly defeat Carthage in the war. So they all sat down and said, give us two months. And then they built themselves 120 ships, learned how to row them, and improved the design of the captured Carthaginian ships. (laughs) That's unbelievably impressive. 60 days. In 60 days. I can't even get anything done in 60 days i started trying to renew my passport 60 days ago yeah and i'm still working (laughs) like it it. takes me like 60 days to get the motivation to file my taxes that is true that's a big build up though yeah that's true and then it takes 10 minutes (laughs) yeah i mean romans never actually had to file taxes so they just had to pay them (laughs) they said to pay them they didn't have to they didn't get anything back (laughs) yeah but it's just to go back to the point of raising a city rome that's not gonna twist they're very impressive but you'll see in this story, as well as I have a few like upcoming episode ideas, maybe sticking the Rome theme. They're kind of dicks. Oh yeah, <laughs> like, they are dicks to conquered people. Specifically, I mean the word barbarian. The definition is if you're not Roman or Greek. Yeah, everyone else is a barbarian. Like every before the UK was the UK, all those people up there, Caesar was like. We could kill everyone if you want to. <laughs> yeah, and won't even lose a wink of sleep. No. So in this two months of building and designing their ships, the Romans made a major change. And that change that they made was to add a platform equipped with a giant spike that could be lowered and stuck into an enemy ship, thus effectively transforming a sea battle into a land battle aboard the decks of the ships and negating Carthage's naval advantage. Very smart. It works marvelously <laughs> yes it is it's just hilarious to, to me that rome was like we admit we're not going to beat you in a naval battle so we're just going to come onto your ships yeah by making it into a giant chain of la- of ships essentially an island in the middle of the sea and then just float towards you yeah. <laughs> it's very smart i mean stick to what you know stick to what you do well it helps them a lot but it eventually backfires on them Roman fleets began to defeat Carthage forces, slowly at first, but eventually proving that their adaptability was too much for the Carthaginian opponents. And Carthage took this uh, very badly and began to execute naval commanders after losing battles, literally crucifying at least one of them. So not what the Bucks did after Mike Budenhoser lost the first NBA finals, or uh, NBA Eastern Conference finals. I don't think we, like executed chris middleton in the middle of the court (laughs) drew holiday wasn't just kidding (laughs) yeah he didn't get crucified out there rome pushed far enough that they eventually landed on the northern coast of africa pushing a land invasion onto their rival's doorstep but interestingly rome withdrew like half of the troops that they landed with once they got there but the thing is they still won the battles because rome was the superior land battle or the land army Carthage couldn't really use their elephants among the rocky terrain that the Romans were occupying, so eventually peace talks began, by this point for the second time because Carthage had denied terms earlier on. But this time, the Roman demands were too great for Carthage to agree to. 
Then a Spartan mercenary commander named Xanthippus, Zen, then Xanthippus, sure. Sure. <laughs> took over on Carthage's behalf and destroyed the Romans, killing 12,000 of them while only losing around 800 on the side of Carthage. So, huge win. Honestly, shout out the outside help. Spartans, man. <laughs> they just were so, maybe like they took a wrong right trying to get to <laughs> Athens or something. They ended up on a boat somehow. They're, they're like, let's help out these people down here. They seem kind of cool. That's where they actually do their spring breaks in the <laughs> yeah, northern that's where end. They get their tan. Yeah, the northern end of. Uh, of Africa. <laughs> so the fleeing remains of the Romans did get out, but many of them were killed when they got picked up by reinforcements because a storm sank a bunch of their boats and killed, according to ancient historians, possibly up to 100,000 men. That is nuts. That's a big L. That's so many people. That's Mother Nature telling you to fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> there'll be no fighting here. And this today. is like the first of three times this is going to happen, pretty much. You know what? No matter what humans make in terms of weaponry, Mother Nature still has the highest kill count. Absolutely. The Romans then retreated to Sicily for a short time, where they got hit by another storm that sank over a hundred ships, possibly due to the added weight of those Corvus ramps that they added to the ships, mm. which apparently don't get mentioned again after this point. Yeah, they, yeah, they so were they, like, we are floating around with anchors, they like multiple anchors. They learned their lesson, I guess. <laughs> Carthage tried to go back to Sicily to take back some of the lost land there, but ultimately were pushed out again by the Romans. So it was kind of this constant back and forth, with Rome suffering losses on the sea and Carthage on the land. Adding to the Roman misfortunes, the sacred chickens that the consul had didn't eat prior to a battle, which was apparently a bad omen, and then a fleet consisting of over 800 Roman ships was once again sunk by a storm. Italy at this point is just running out of wood. Yeah, <laughs> like, there's so many ships, but, but also the sacred chickens. I, yeah, I read the th the term sacred chickens, and I was like, "All right, I got to see if this is legitimate or not." I, I need to circle back on that one. So yeah. I looked it up, and I found a translation from a professor from the University of Michigan of a text about this, and I'll read it verbatim here. Sacred chickens were chickens raised by priests in Roman times and which were used for making auguries. And auguries are like telling the future, pretty much. Oh. Nothing significant was undertaken in the Senate or in the armies without omens being drawn from the sacred chickens. The most common method of drawing these omens consisted in examining the manner in which the chickens dealt with grain that was presented to them. If they ate it avidly while stomping their feet and scattering it here and there, the augury was favorable. If they refused to eat and drink, the omen was bad, and the undertaking for which it was consulted was abandoned. When there was a need to render this sort of divination favorable, the chickens were left in a cage for a certain amount of time without eating. After that, the priests opened the cage and threw the feed to them. <laughs> this is the empire that takes over the world and spreads Christianity everywhere. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's hilarious that they're just like, we really need a W right now, so let's just starve the chickens to make sure that they eat. One senator who's probably just maybe more reasonably minded is like, we just need, I'm sick of these freaking chickens ruining all of my plants. I'm trying to get just an aqueduct built and nothing will freaking happen because these stupid chickens. This is why I say it's so much for a whimsical. Because it's oh, like yeah. we're relying on sacred chickens for battle forecasts. Right. Oh my gosh. Like Scipio is just holding his sword as tight as he can, <laughs> waiting for old cockadoodle dude to back at some grain. Well, there's and then that. Reading that I just read from goes on to talk about a specific battle where they lied to the commander and said like, "Oh yeah, it ate it," but it really didn't. And the guy's like, "Ah, someone said that they might have lied to me, but if they lied, it's just gonna come back to them, not me." No. Oh. And then what, before the battle starts, some random person accidentally loses an arrow and kills one of the chickens, and then the Romans win the battle. <laughs> That's my favorite. It's, I love those hilarious. stories. The chicken just caught. Caught a stray. Caught a stray. <laughs> An innocent bystander. But back to the Punic War, both sides were basically broke at this point. So Rome and Carthage agreed to pause the fighting for a minute and recoup. And this is where Hamilcar Barca shows up. So the name Barca has been mentioned in the intro. 
meaning that this was the father of Hannibal Barca, the man who is going to be the main focus today. And Hamilcar was a good general in his own right. He took over the Carthaginian forces and began raiding the Italian coast, as well as Sicily, striking the rear of the Roman forces using quick guerrilla tactics. And this is where the name Barca comes from, because Barca apparently means lightning as a reference to his fast maneuvers and guerrilla tactics. Right. Again, we haven't talked about strong names throughout history in a long time. That is a very strong name. Hannibal Lightning. Hannibal Lightning. That's so intimidating. And he's riding elephants. Like, yeah. how are you supposed to just be across mountains? <laughs> how are you supposed to get up as your as a Roman soldier, a legionnaire, and say, "All right, we got this." We're just only going up against lightning. <laughs> yeah, lightning. He's kachowin across the Alps. He's kachowin. <laughs> <laughs> they were kachigan, and they were kachowin. <laughs> So he used these quick guerrilla tactics to make up for the lack of a large Carthaginian army, and Hamilcar made numerous advances through Italy with a relatively small force of only around 20,000 people, which right now sounds like a lot in our modern sensibilities, but you got to remember that like the Roman reinforcements were 100,000 that sank in the sea. So this is pretty small compared to some of these armies that are getting mustered up. Hamilcar was eventually got praise from Greek historian Polybius, who we mentioned earlier, for being the best Carthaginian general in the First Punic War, which is saying a lot. There were some great fighters that, like going on here. Carthage overall had a good, good roster of generals on their side, so it's kind of surprising that they struggled as much as they did, but I guess most of them were probably naval generals to start with and right, had to learn the, Navy the land focused. part. Yeah. I mean, they were probably super educated, too. Yeah. I mean, with with wealth comes education programs and just, I guess, not having to survive every single yeah. day, being able to read a book. So while Hamilcar was moving through Italy, another general named Hanno was moving through Libya in northern Africa to expand Carthage's empire there and to bring in more tax revenue, which was sorely needed to help fund the war. But despite this added revenue to help fund the war, it ended on March 10th, 241 BC, which is like a week ago as of this recording. So kind of... Happy in- anniversary. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, happy anniversary to the end of the First Punic War. Uh, and the Romans defeated Hanno as he was moving to relieve a Roman besieged city. And it wasn't necessarily that they suffered a huge loss... Carthage was just kind of sick of trying to afford this war that was mostly a stalemate and ended up seeking peace terms after actively rejecting the first two times. Yeah, it's hard to fund wars, as you may guess. Like, yeah. Boats are not cheap. Yeah. Troops are not cheap. But this is insane to me that Rome was able to afford, like, building a thousand new ships pretty much because they just kept sinking. And they were like, yeah, we got money. Must be nice. Yeah. And also, like the to build all of them again in those two months to start things off, like that's insane that they yeah. just had that money. Unless they just have the <clears throat> biggest IOU of all time. Lots of slaves. Lot that also, I guess, helps. In the end, Rome got Sicily as well as the surrounding islands and a large reparation payment from the already cash, already cash strapped Carthage. But this was just another problem for Hamilcar and the Carthaginians, because after the First Punic War ended, Carthage faced a threat from back home. Basically, when the mercenary troops who aided them in the war realized that they weren't going to get paid, they jointly rebelled and laid siege to Carthage. Now that one makes sense. If (laughs) all of a sudden you were just told, actually, guys, thank you for your slaughtering and your helps decapitating Roman heads. Here's nothing. Yeah, exactly. This is... uh, why when we talked about the british and american spies in the revolution it's mm-hmm. like a lot of them just defected because they didn't get paid yeah that's why <laughs> benedict arnold became benedict arnold it's crazy that people think people will work for free in yeah. this case never gonna work yeah. but they were so sure that they could win and they're just right. like sorry guys we got no money <laughs> yeah if they open up their wallets and it's just a, <laughs> like a cartoon <laughs> So Hamilcar and Hanno returned back to Carthage from their frontline war against the Romans and joined forces to quell the revolt. Hamilcar was able to break the siege on Carthage and move on to defeat an army led by a man whose name, no joke, was Spendius. That's where all the frickin' money went. (laughs) Spendius was fighting in a war over not getting paid. (laughs) 
So for Hamilcar, at the beginning, things were going well. He was able to recruit one of the forces originally rebelling by promising their leader his daughter's hand in marriage, which netted him 12,000 troops and nearly 100 elephants. That's a good trade. That's not a bad trade. (laughs) Yeah, you're half my daughter, and then you get 12,000 troops and 100 elephants? Hell yeah. That's an incredible deal. Would you take that deal? i take that deal. Yeah, I think so. Sorry, Sarah, you're going over over to this guy. Right, he must have been just the ugliest general of all time. So while things were going well for Hamilcar, Hanno was struggling a bit. He was losing battles trying to take back the island of Sardinia, and others were joining forces against him because they saw that they could beat Hanno. (laughs) And it was at this point that both sides began to increase their brutality in the war, with the rebel side mutilating Carthaginian prisoners and Hamilcar trampling his captives with elephants. Yeah, at this point it gets really dirty. Yeah. And it's just happening to relative innocence. Yeah. Yeah. Zuki apparently parts. doesn't like that either. You know what? Zuki, good moral, she hates war crimes. Good moral compass for the podcast. Oh, yeah. You know what? She, she, had that, she got that from her dad. <laughs> but yeah, Zuki confirmed hates war crimes. Hates war crimes. So part of the Patreon calendar will not be her <laughs> doing anything too silly. Hanno and Hamilcar were pretty commonly known as rivals so they didn't really always get along and they couldn't agree how to move forward with this mercenary war and so they put it up to a vote and the troops elected Hamilcar to be their sole leader which settled the argument. Carthage's old rival Rome actually helped them out by giving them back a bunch of captured soldiers for free and at the same time one of the Sicilian tyrants seeked to help seeked to help Carthage because he didn't want Rome to become too strong. Hamilcar was then able to corner all of the rebel armies and kill all of them except for the generals who had when they asked for peace and then he took those generals to the rebel capital and crucified all of them. So Oof. that was that. Crucifixion is hot in the streets at this point. It did not start with old JC. Carthage <laughs> loved to crucify people. Apparently. Honestly, Rome, Carthage, anyone could catch a cross. Yeah. <laughs> After this mercenary war was over, Hamilcar moved on to Spain. Because since they couldn't get their island holdings back, Carthage looked to the Spanish coast to expand and recoup losses from their wars. With Hamilcar at the helm, the new land force reached numbers near 50,000 and began to send a good amount of riches back to Carthage at home. This is when Rome started to get suspicious again, but good old Hamilcar just told them that he was trying to secure wealth in Spain so that Carthage could pay for their reparations to Rome. We're just trying to pay our our, our debts off. Nothing nothing to see here. Yeah. He continued, oh, is that our flag flying above the entire Iberian area? Oh, ignore oh, weird. that. Weird. <laughs> it's just saying that they owe us stuff, you know, so that we can yes. give it to you. Yes. It's called trickle-down economics. Have ever you ever heard, heard of it? it? <laughs> or in this case, it would probably be trickle-up, but either way. Or just trickle-up is just economics. Pretty much. <laughs> so good old Hammy continued his campaign through Spain, and... Eventually, he was betrayed by some local allies and was forced to retreat, and he drowned while crossing a river. I feel like this happens to a lot of generals. That really does. I mean, that happened to one of the holy Roman emperors, Barbarossa. They just got to stop crossing rivers. Honestly, the Crusades, yeah. Like, take your armor off, homies. But before he died, he made his sons swear to always be rivals to Rome, a promise that they would keep. Hammy's son, Hasdrubal, took over the army for a while after his father's death, and he was soon replaced by none other than Hannibal. Boom, boom, boom. And Evan will tell us more. So not a ton is known about Hannibal's early life. I mean, we kind of see that. That's a very recurring theme with a lot of these characters. They don't get recorded in history until they start doing historical things. Yeah, and I mean, Carthage is completely annihilated after all this. The so only like, book that exists, like you mentioned, was the How to Grow Crops and yeah. like Irrigate. <laughs> Didn't say anything about Hannibal. No. However, it's also a little wild that we don't know more, considering he's one of the most famous generals in the ancient world. In fact, one scholar actually said, and I quote, There is much we do not know about this man, though he is one of the greatest generals in antiquity. No surviving ancient biography makes him the subject, and Hannibal slips in and out of focus according to the emphasis that other authors give his deeds and character. So, like we talked about a little bit, Rome 
wrote a majority of the entries about Hannibal. One of the greatest empires in the his- probably the greatest empire in the history of humankind. So they kind of had a lot to say in what got put in the history books. Do you think that there were like multiple revisions? Like every hundred years, they'd be like, actually, let's like make him the worst. Yeah. <laughs> they just switch things up. Nothing is really known of Hannibal's mother. And the only reason we know his dad is because he was also a great general in the wars against Rome. And speaking of, and I love that you call him Hammy. Yeah. It's very I, funny. I like started, ha- like, I was like sick of typing his name out all the time. So I was, like, I'm going to call him Hammy. <laughs> Hammy. Good old Hams. Speaking of good old Hammy, he was said to have taken Hannibal to Spain when the boy was around nine years old. Before bringing his son over to Spain officially, Hammy made Hannibal lay his hands on the body of a sacrificial victim and swear he would never be a friend to Rome. Hey, 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 son, son, put your hands on this dead guy that we're about to kill for the gods and say that you'll never like Rome. And then pinky promise while you're killing him. Okay, Dad. Yeah, he had nine. <laughs> Nothing weird about this. Yeah, in the uh, one of the documentaries that I watched uh, from History.com, it was The Barbarians Rising, which is, it, co- it combines a biography and dramatic storytelling. Sure. And one of the scenes that they do... Wait, History Channel with dramatic storytelling? You betcha, hi- <laughs> you betcha Heine, yeah. You bet your hammy. <laughs> uh, in this scene, in the recreation, they have a fountain of blood, and he, Hammy scoops up from a cup made of someone's skull a cup of blood and has Hannibal take the blood and run it through his hair. So that's, that's one little, way to do it. It's a little bit. Different. They didn't have pomade back then. That was just the, oh, that's probably why everyone smelled. <laughs> Can't smell good, I'm guessing. No. A lot of irony smells. Very iron. <laughs> that's why it's called the Iron Age at this time. Fun fact. I hate it here. But it was during this time, or excuse me, it was right after this time that Hannibal learned how to fight, track, and outmaneuver his opponents. Hannibal was a quick learner because when his brother-in-law, his Jubal, was assassinated, Hannibal took command of the Carthaginian army at 25 or 26, which... That's me. (laughs) He didn't start a podcast, though, so really, who did the more brave feat? (sighs) Controlling one of the most formidable forces in the Mediterranean area when Rome is kind of becoming Rome. Doing a podcast talking about that. Or, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Or spending an hour and a half recording (laughs) (laughs) which one's harder really right i'm very parched right now so i don't know if he can speak to the same while speaking to a microphone (laughs) hannibal immediately set his sights on consolidating holdings in spain marrying a spanish princess named uh, i'm I'm so excited (laughs) i didn't have this name (laughs) mills and miles I looked it up, and there's like three different ways to pronounce it, so... You've... It's always me. <laughs> it's I-M-I-L-C-E. C-E. I think it's Emils, or Emilka. That Let's call weird. her Emily. <laughs> yes. No. I mean, so, you could call her anything. You, you could call her Ditto. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but while he was, or after he married Emils, <laughs> he went about conquering various Spanish tribes. Hannibal established a base on the coast of Spain and set his sights on his eternal rival, the Romans. Roman Carthage had established a treaty after the First Punic War, which we covered, and in this treaty established the Ebro River as a boundary in northern Spain that Carthage could not cross. Rome was openly dealing with a city south of the border in what was technically allowed to Carthage. So. There is a border, but then no one built a wall, so how was someone supposed to know? Oh. Right. <laughs> well, the the funny part is Rome was like, ah, just tell them that the river is the border, because the, if they cross that river, then they'd have to cross the Alps to get to us. So technically, right. there's already a natural border. So this is pretty much just us saying, here, stop here. Stop here. And if you go any further, good luck. <laughs> go back the way you came. But when Hannibal attacked the city after Rome set up a hostile government there, Rome declared it as an act of war and demanded that Hannibal surrender. When Hannibal refused, the Second Punic War began, which is a war that would almost 
entirely be run by Hannibal on the side of the Carthaginians. So in the first Punic War, there was actually some, nope, multiple branches of the military gang involved. And in this one, it's pretty much just Hannibal yeah. being like, catch these hands. He does pretty much everything. <laughs> Hannibal stayed back at his base in Spain to prepare for the war for a while, eventually leaving to cross the Ebro in spring of 218 BC and move into the Pyrenees Mountains. Meanwhile, he left his actual brother, also named Hasdrubal. This part was so confusing. I know, that took a while. So the one that was assassinated was actually his brother-in-law. Brother-in-law, yeah. The person he left back was his actual brother. So his dad must have gotten remarried at some point. Right, and he was like, uh, what's a good name? <laughs> but it's funny because like his original son gets killed almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And then his two sons that are like from the second marriage, or from a random p woman right. who knows if they were married are the good ones. <laughs> are the good ones, the really good and smart ones. But Hasdrubal was in charge of protecting Spain and North Africa with a sizable army himself. On his way through Spain, Hannibal recruited more and more men until his numbers sat around 50,000. And there is some debate here. Uh, typical numbers range from 30,000 to 90,000, so I guess let's just split the middle here. This is the thing with the ancient sources. It's like... You read one source, and it'll be, oh, yeah, he crossed with 24,000 men. And then the next one will be like, he crossed with 89,000 men. And then another source is, he had the entire continent of Africa just <laughs> crossing, the, crossing the Alps. So we're, we're doing guesstimates today. <laughs> yes. Uh, compromising this army was 9,000 to 12,000 cavalry. And, excuse me, it was 50,000 infantry and 9,000 to 12,000 cavalry, along with 37 elephants, which it's very funny that that's the exact number. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I guess that makes sense. He can't really be like, there was 100,000 elephants. I saw one conflicting thing, and it said 38 elephants. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so it's right around there. <laughs> Since Hannibal was cut off on the coastal route to Italy by the Roman general Publius Cornelius Scipio, and other allies of Rome, Hannibal had no other choice but to cross the nearly impassable mountain range of the Alps. Okay, f one, is it Scipio or is it Scipio? I've heard it Because Scipio sounds like he's a peanut butter guy. That is true. It's like made of peanut butter. I think I heard Scipio. That's okay. the one that revolves we'll to me and is special in my heart. Okay, we'll do Scipio. Thank you. That he, was my one request he's of the, the three little, years. He, he's a little boy with a spinny hat carrying a jar of Skippy peanut butter. Hey, Hannibal, buy those <laughs> Skip Rocks. And Hannibal's like, punches him in the head. No, nerd. But also... Freaking nerd. <laughs> yeah, the, com like, the compromise for Hannibal here is, all right, can't use the Navy. Let's cross this Let's impassable cross mountain range that everyone's telling me I will die doing. Yeah, all of his men were like, please let there be a boat. Please let there be a yeah. boat. And then they get there and there's no boat. It's like, oh, no. I can understand why Rome was so shocked when he actually made it. Because they're like, that's an insane person's gambit. He's got it. Yep. <laughs> so I don't blame them for not being prepared when he arrives. I don't blame them for not, yeah, for just not worrying about it for the first long time of their history. Because no one dared to do it. Right, because Scipio's like, okay, we put down all these revolts. Finally time to relax. Oh, an African guy just came over the Alps <laughs> yeah. and is trying to kill us from the north. Okay. Yeah, all I hear is... <laughs> <laughs> that was a mixture of an elephant and horse. I mean, they had both, so technically you were not wrong. So a lot of controversy has surrounded the details of Hannibal's movements after crossing the Rhone River. Polybius states that he crossed it while the river was still in one stream and a distance of four days' march from the sea. Hannibal used coracles, excuse me, coracles. I had to look up what that was, and it's like a wicker boat. Yep, and boats locally commandeered. Uh, for the elephants, he made jetties out into the river and floated the elephants from those on earth-covered rafts, which is very it's cute. It's insane to me. That's like, how did the, the Donner things. Party fail to ford rivers, and this guy's getting <laughs> elephants across? This is insane. Hannibal didn't even have wagons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right and the he's like no problem yeah and the party the Dahmer party was like oh no our wheel broke <laughs> bring a spare did you call him the Dahmer party i did i was hoping <laughs> we could just move on jeffrey from that. Dahmer just jeffrey hosting Dahmer's like a party. punch bowl social <laughs> ew i would never drink out of Je jeffrey Dahmer's punch bowl speaking of blood and skulls yeah <laughs> 
Horses embarked on large boats or were made to swim. I thought the elephants are like, ha. Yeah, suckers. During the operation, hostile Gauls appeared on the eastern bank of the river, and Hannibal dispatched a force under Hanno to cross farther upstream and attack them from behind. As the Gauls attempted to block Hannibal's crossing, Hanno's forces struck, scattering the Gauls and allowing the main body of the Carthaginian army to transit the river unopposed. This is important. Okay, so we didn't really mention why the Rhone River is kind of important in this context, but the Romans, specifically Scipio, thought that he wasn't going to be crossing the Rhone for another like week. Mm. And so he like gets to where they think they're going to cross the Rhone River and gets word that, oh, they already came through here and they're like way up there now. Yeah. And so the fact that Hannibal got across so like fluidly and didn't really meet opposition probably saved him. Because if he would have met with Scipio at the river, I don't know if it would have gone as well. No. Hannibal continued to meet friendly tribes along his way to the Alps, one of whom was probably extremely helpful in his movements forward. The Boy tribe, who were Celts who had been struggling under Roman control, had great knowledge of the Alpine passes, leaving Hannibal with great knowledge of which routes to take going forward. This isn't funny to anyone else, but like, boy is spelled B O I. Boy, yes. <laughs> every time I read it, I'm like, yeah, boy, yeah, boy. <laughs> After every single kill, like their warriors have to drop a <laughs> sick, yeah, boy, longest yeah, boy in history. Can you imagine just a thousand from yeah, the, boys from the Alps, from the Alps, <laughs> along with elephants? The That's original probably, yodel. Oh my gosh, yodel, hey, boy, <laughs> boy. <laughs> According to Polybius, who is said to have taken the route through the mountains himself, Hannibal's movements through the mountains was not unopposed. Multiple tribes ambushed the Carthaginian forces, forcing Hannibal to take countermeasures to minimize his losses. Along the way, he captured towns where he could, to provide food for the army. But with tens of thousands of men and a ton of animals, food stores ran out very quickly. During ambushes, men and animals also lost their footing on the treacherous pathways to the mountains. Hannibal had to fake out his attackers, camping out in the open to allow his pack animals to pass below without being detected. So, not only does he have to cross this big old mountain range, he's constantly pretty much getting shot at yeah. during the entire time. And these the Gallic people here are just using like Indiana Jones style traps, da, like da, rolling da. giant rocks yeah. down the cliffs and stuff. <laughs> yeah. so he's trying to dodge that too. Uh, eventually Hannibal's forces reached the summit and camped for a few days before moving down into Italy. The exact location is unknown, but some have proposed that they do actually know. This is again very, very debated. However, most evidence points to a southern crossing at the Col de la Traversette, which is the highest road, but even Polybius and Livy don't know which it was, despite interviewing survivors of Hannibal's army. Yeah, I read a little bit into like how they decided that this was the 90% sure route that he took. They're like, ah, we found some really old soil that has a lot of horse shit in it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, no, no other route has horse shit in the soil. So apparently that's the proof that they have that Hannibal's army probably passed through here. One could say the proof is in the pudding. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Along the end stages of the route, snow was falling on the pass, making the descent even more treacherous. Rock slides made travel on the narrow track hazardous, and the army was held up for most of a day while it was made passable for the pack animals and elephants. Food shortages and treacherous terrain took its toll on the army. Finally, on the 15th day after a journey of five months from Cartagena, with 25,000 infantry, 6,000 cavalry, and some of his original 37 elephants, Hannibal descended into Italy. The last part of this is almost the most insane because it was, they said it was so steep that some of just the regular soldiers could barely keep their footing without sliding all the way down. So they actually built a road mm. out of here so that they could get the elephants and stuff down and then they just went down on their own. But this is also like the Donner Party where it's just like, oh yeah, they chopped through an entire forest and built a road through they the mountains. It's like... People were just way more ambitious to get things done back then. Oh, if I run into just about any obstacle, I'm like, I could probably get to this later. <laughs> Maybe if, we if can there's a back. little bit of traffic, I'm upset. Oh, my goodness, let alone building an entire road. 
But it's also, it needs to be pointed out that, again, a large part of his force is tribes. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not all people from Carthage. It's not all people from the Carthaginian Empire, if you will. Like, this is very much an extremely diverse set of people that he's leading and trying to get through this huge mountain range while getting attacked by uh, tribes using guerrilla tactics, while boulders are being (laughs) rolled down, while the environment, it's snowing, there's rock slides, and he's able to get through it with a large part of his force. Like, there's a good chance that half of these people couldn't even talk to each other because they didn't have the same language. Right? Yeah, it's crazy. Hannibal's numbers did dwindle a bit from crossing the Alps, and he no longer had the numbers advantage on Scipio. Despite this, some tribes in Rome were revolting, and the first meeting between Hannibal and the Romans in battle saw Hannibal and his Numidian cavalry victorious and saw Scipio severely wounded. Hannibal attempted to engage a second time, but the efforts failed. Instead, he taunted out a different army and soundly defeated them, although Scipio and his legions most likely didn't take part in the battle. After these big W's, more local tribes began to buffer Hannibal's forces. The Carthaginian forces won more battles, like at Trebia, where they dispatched somewhere between 20,000 and 30,000 Romans. He is winning huge, like huge victories. Yeah, they're not just, like, they're decisive. Yeah. Like, sound, like, fatalities right and because i mean he descends into italy with like thirty thousand men or mm-hmm. so and th- like he's fighting entire roman legions and he's just like okay <laughs> and he's just like after slapping them. after just going through a giant feat of crossing a mountain range it's like like when did he sit- tired <laughs> right like when did they all just sit down like have a beer apparently they never had to <laughs> After winter passed, Hannibal was pushed away from the main routes south and instead crossed through some of the marshes along the Arno River in northern Italy, where he lost sight in one of his eyes due to infection. This didn't stop him, though, as he outmaneuvered his opponents, killing at least 15,000 Roman soldiers in one battle by driving them into a lake to drown and capturing 15,000 more insane numbers These, yeah I, I love this part because they just say like ah yeah they crossed through some like nearly impassable marshes he lost sight in an eye and then he went and killed a bunch of romans the next day pretty yeah. much it's like what talk about taking out the rage like ah my eye yeah i'm gonna take everyone else's eyes screw these romans roman leaders started employing scorched earth tactics to deprive hannibal of provisions but soon it needed to face him again in battle yeah, Rome was pretty much open now. Like the, mm-hmm. he was getting as close as possible to Rome, and he was like not too far from getting there and being able to assault the city itself. So the leaders were like, "Ah, we got to do something." So they had, like elected a dictator, and mm-hmm. then he did all this scorched earth stuff, and everyone's like, "This is taking too long." And then they <laughs> took him out. <laughs> they were shivering in their togas, yeah. if you will. Rome quickly raised an army of eighty thousand men the largest in Roman history at that point, all to stop one man and his vagabond forces. Hannibal was ready, though. He captured a supply depot near a city called Cannae and waited. Carthage's forces controlled the water supply and forced Rome's forces into a narrow plain. When the Romans arrived, tightly packed in their formations, Hannibal allowed his forces to yield in the middle to form a crescent moon shape. So the fighting is happening here. So they're all lined up. We're talking 80,000 Roman soldiers. We're talking roughly probably right at 30,000 Carthaginians, probably a little bit more, maybe bolstered by some tribes uh, and cavalry. Yeah. So the Romans definitely have the numbers advantage here, but Hannibal Hannibal has by far... The more like terrain advantage, and he just knows how to like what to expect. Yeah, I think the uh, Roman leader, I think his name was Varro or Varro, something mm-hmm. like that. Uh, but he was like, "Well, if we just overwhelm them with numbers in the middle of the line, then eventually we'll get through." But Hannibal was like, "Well, I'll just put my first line in the middle, and then I'll put all my veteran guys on the outside," and it worked perfectly to how he wanted it to. Yes, to Jacob's point, the line doesn't break, so. 
a majority of the Roman focus is trying to break that front line. And when it doesn't break and they're slowly just yielding, let's say like fake yield, like slowly backing up, backing up, backing up, that caught the Romans in a very bad predicament where they were very easy to flank. So as Jacob mentioned, his vet, Hannibal's veteran forces swept around on the sides, on each side, and started just hacking them. So right now, the Romans are surrounded on three sides. Then the Numidian cavalry, just who just got done defeating the Roman cavalry, comes in and has a full free-reigned charge on the back of the huge Roman force. Yeah. So pretty much like crescent moon shape eventually just turns into a complete circle around yep. the Roman forces. And it was said that they were pushed because they were already tightly packed in like the formations they were in. And by the time they got surrounded, it was said that they were tightly, so tightly packed that people in the middle couldn't even swing their swords because it was so like, I don't know what they were going to be swinging at. Right. But they just were. That's how tight it was that it was shoulder to shoulder. Like again, picture Battle of the Bastards from Game of Thrones. Yeah. If you if you've seen that, you kinda understand. Everyone's what this is. diet. <laughs> Everyone. Hannibal's forces completely annihilated Rome's army, dealing what would be known as the worst defeat Rome had ever suffered. And again, this was an empire that lasted for I mean, the official Roman Empire, like what, like twelve hundred, thirteen hundred years? Yeah. I apologize for not knowing that offhand, but but like they long, had long huge losses come like with Caesar, they suffered huge losses and stuff. Yeah. But everyone's like, this is the worst loss Rome has ever had after the Battle of Canaan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Virtually one in five Roman men of military age were killed during this battle. And this affected households at every level of society. Meaning that the wealthy senators died in this battle. I believe the official number, well, official in quotes, was like 70,000 yeah. men died in this battle alone out of 80,000 that participated. Insane numbers. But one of, the, one of the dudes that does survive this is going to become the guy that actually defeats Hannibal yeah. in the end. So it is kind of ironic. <laughs> right. But after this battle, Hannibal has officially become the boogeyman to the Romans for the next multiple years and yeah. was just a symbol of misfortune for the who up to this point was a free-reigning, mighty republic. The uh, Latin phrase that I saw was, it was Hannibal antes portas, which was the, the phrase in Rome, which meant that Hannibal is at the gate. Mm. So that people were just saying that to each other anywhere they went, pretty much. Like, anytime something went bad, people were saying that. No, it's like, God. it's Hannibal's fault. Everything's Hannibal's fault. Yeah. <laughs> and then that phrase eventually became, gee, dang it. Yeah. <laughs> After the battle, Hannibal offered to negotiate peace terms, but the Romans refused. Somehow, Rome was never taken by Hannibal and his forces. The city, after all, was well fortified, and the Carthaginians had to leave their siege equipment when they got to the Alps. It's very hard to carry big slingshots. Yeah. Or catapults, if you will. Like those big rams Rams, that always have like a lion's head on them in the movies and plus there was yeah right and plus there was no more trees in italy because (laughs) they cut them all down for the the navy (laughs) so they couldn't make new big battering rams carthage the city of carthage also refused to send help instead choosing to defend their holdings in spain slowly hannibal's local supporters began to leave when the promise of plunder from a long and tiresome war began to prove fruitless Coupled with the study loss of his African veterans to combat, to com- <laughs> combat, <laughs> nailed it, to combat death and injuries, Hannibal's armies eroded, and he was forced to move to the defensive, gaining only minor victories. While Rome began to recapture some of the areas Hannibal had initially won in, it's very interesting. Rome's approach and the uh, barbarians rising documentary that I mentioned does a really good job of explaining this. They just straight up realized, like, we can't face this guy in open battle for a long time. Yeah, they just, uh, they decided we're not going to go on the offensive. We're just going to, if he wants to come to us, mm-hmm. we'll do that. Right. Like, they truly decide to play the waiting game. And again, Carthage is not backing Hannibal at this point. They're not sending more troops. Yeah. So it's literally just Hannibal by himself, and he's not getting any backup. So playing the waiting game is probably the best decision 
Maybe in Roman history. This is where the scorched earth stuff from way earlier comes into play because he can't find food to feed the people that he's fighting with. And then a lot of them are starting to defect because of that and they're not getting paid. So yeah, a lot of that stuff comes back to bite him in the butt. As Jubal attempted to reinforce his brother in Italy, but he and his forces were defeated. So as Jubal actually tried... He, I think he did. He did cross, he did the, cross Alps. the Alps. Yeah. yeah. So even both of the brothers, both of them, and, props. Yeah. I don't know if Hannibal sent a messenger and said like, "Hey, take this route." Or, yeah, this is how you do it. But props. But he doesn't have as good of a reception when he gets there. No. As Jubal himself was actually killed in this battle, with his severed head being sent to Hannibal afterwards. It's a rough day. Upon seeing this, Hannibal lamented his brother's death by stating, and I quote. There lies the fate of Carthage. So at this point, Hannibal himself is like, yeah, boys. Yeah, boys. We're kind of a or SOL. Yeah, right he. Here. I think he kind of understood that if that reinforcement party didn't get to him, there was no way he was going to take Rome. Yeah. And if he didn't take Rome, then things were kind of, they were, they were SOL. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like we mentioned after the Battle of Cannae, Rome changed the strategy and Publius Scipio son of the original Scipio, began to push the Carthaginian forces out of Spain, while the Romans refused to directly confront Hannibal in Italy. And this Publius Scipio is the guy that escaped from the Battle of Cannae. Yes, yes. The big event happened here uh, when Scipio, soon to be known as Scipio Africanus, made landfall on the North African coast. He dispatched the Numidians, who still remained Carthage's biggest ally, and now threatened to break through Carthage itself. Hannibal was forced to return home and abandon any hope of taking Italy. A preliminary armistice was set in place with severe terms imposed by Scipio. But when Roman ambassadors were returning to present the original peace proposals, Carthage simultaneously violated the ceasefire. The details of what happened next kind of differ, but ultimately things ended up at a place called Zama. Yeah, so they're finally getting done with the fighting. And then Carthage is like, actually, <laughs> run it back. Hannibal thought that he could still count on the veterans from his Italian campaign. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll give them the you, old one, two. You can count on us, Hannibal. <laughs> Their dentures fall out. <laughs> They're probably 35 at this point. I mean, he's <laughs> like 60 at this point. Right, so. right, yeah, yeah. Having learned from previous, battle, from previous battles, the Romans allowed the war elephants to pass through large gaps in their lines, and the first two lines of Hannibal's forces were quickly taken care of. The veteran line was all that was left, but when the Roman and Numidian combined cavalry pushed behind Hannibal, he knew he had lost. But you didn't tell us they had horses. Well, it probably took him so long to turn around, he couldn't see the horse. <laughs> Hold on! But it is funny that Rome's countermeasures to the elephants is like, yeah, just let them go through. And then they just, the elephants literally just started rampaging. Like, yeah. they didn't know what to do. And some of the other elephants, like, seeing that, started rampaging in the Carthage lines. So they just started stepping on their own people. Yeah, elephants are very effective until they're not. Yeah. So until if you they just... see a mouse. Oh, yeah, too. Eek! <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, it's, I don't think we covered the Carthaginian war elephant, really, but how they were set up is they had little, for lack of a better word, like battle ramparts built on their backs, and people would be on top shooting arrows or, like, throwing spears and giving them old stab-stab from... Like, if you've seen Lord of the below. Rings, think, yes. of, think of how uh, Legolas, like, climbs on one of those elephants. Right. They're, pr- they're pretty much like that, except not that big. <laughs> right, not, not as big as a mountain. Yeah. Hannibal was able to escape Zama alive, but that was the end of his fighting for Carthage. Yeah, this is uh, this is uh, the downtrend begins for him. Mm. I mean, it already kind of started when he had to leave Rome, but... Right. After losing, Rome and Carthage came to terms on a treaty and ended the Second Punic War for good. Carthage once again had to pay huge reparations to Rome and was now under their thumb, not able to make military moves without Roman approval. Hannibal was moved from military life into political life, maintaining hope that he may once again take up arms against Rome. When Rome demanded Hannibal's extradition to pay for his rampage through Italy, 
Hannibal was forced to flee. I do love that he goes into this period of his life just being the spiteful old man. Oh, yeah. Like, keeping to that promise that he made to his father, like, to a T. <laughs> oh, he will not go down at this point without a fight. I mean, like, I guess they sent your brother's head to you. <laughs> so yeah, that's got to be yeah. traumatic. Hannibal moved to Syria, serving as chief military advisor for Ant- Antiochus III. When Antiochus and Hannibal, who was commanding some of his first naval battles, was defeated by Rome, he moved again as Rome pursued him. It's believed he moved to join other rebel forces, either in Crete or Armenia, fighting in more naval battles. In one case, it was even said that he threw baskets of snakes during these naval battles into enemy vessels and was one of the first cases of biological warfare. I do love that if, immediately when he gets put onto a boat, he's like, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> just one I'm pi- the greatest general in this time period, yeah. but I don't know how to do boats. <laughs> how does one boat? And then he's like, what can we kill him with on a boat? Let's just, just throw snakes at him. <laughs> yeah, he's at the first ever, I got, instead of a whiteboard, it's just a huge rock. And yeah. he's just writing different generals' ideas. Like, all right, I heard... What I hear, I heard launch catapulted lions this, at them. This okay. is an improv class. It's like, can I get oh a location <laughs> on a boat? Can I get a, a scenario? Oh, you're fighting the Romans. Uh, can I get like an object? Snakes, snakes. <laughs> okay, we can work with that. <laughs> we can do it. We can do it. At this point, Rome had enough control of all the surrounding areas that Hannibal knew he had nowhere else to escape. But even to the end, he was determined to outmaneuver his eternal rival one last time. As the Roman forces closed in on him, he sent out his last faithful servant to check all of his secret exits, reporting back that enemy guards defended every exit. Hannibal then committed suicide by drinking poison and died at the age of 66. Damn Romans ain't gonna get me. Yeah, I mean, gotta go out on your own terms when you're fighting a li- literally a lifelong enemy. Yeah. After Hannibal, Carthage lasted only 35 more years. Rome warred with them for a third time, captured the city, and burnt it to the ground. Carthage's demise marked the beginning of Rome's ascent to the greatest power of the Mediterranean for centuries to come. Despite being Rome's worst nightmare, Hannibal was also one of the greatest teachers. His actions forced the Romans to reshape their military as well as their society, moving from a citizen-soldier army to a professional standing army. Strategy and tactics employed by Hannibal have become mandatory study for commanders from Julius Caesar to Napoleon Bonaparte, meaning that even though he was defeated by Rome, his legend will never be forgotten. Pour one out for Rome. Honestly, one. pour one out. That's pour a cup of blood from a skull out for Hannibal. I'm going to question you if you do that. going to say, where'd you get it? But if I'll you... be like, I'll never tell. <laughs> and I'll just like become a million bats and fly off. <laughs> But yeah, the the Battle of Cannae, or Cannae, however you want to pronounce it, that's ah. like the taught in pretty much every military strategy school. Right. It's just like the double envelopment. Get behind them, get on the sides. Honestly, I'll have to remember that for maybe if I paintball next. I can't imagine the next time I'll if, have to use it, but... If you have an army of 25,000 men <laughs> yeah. that can do that, <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> but no, it's, it is very interesting. The life that he lived was... You would have to say it had to be extremely hard life, meaning like oh yeah, it was not lavish. He didn't, unlike a lot of other generals, he really didn't. Like he was so focused on defeating Rome and killing Romans, he didn't really have much me time. So single minded intensity can get you very far. <laughs> it can get you to cross the Alps. He's That's like, how far. I. He's like a CEO of a company. Like he's got that psychopathic trait yeah. where all he cares about is succeeding at his goal. Right. So yeah, he doesn't care who he tramples literally in the way. But yeah, it's yeah. He's he's crazy man. I cannot. But I it it really does say a lot though that we have so much surviving writing from mm-hmm. like enemy sources for the most part. So the, but the fact that they erected statues to him and stuff, it's like hey. You pretty much reorganized our entire system here, so I guess we kind of have to put a statue up for you. Right. I mean, they switch from citizen base to a standing army. Yeah. This is where they start 
conquering, conquering. Yeah, and they switched from like the Republic to like the Emperor style setup, and mm. that eventually became the Roman Empire. Right. So yeah, it it is crazy that the, the pr- pretty much the shift from Republic to Empire happens because of Hannibal. Wow, that is insane. That's a that's a big role to that's have a in history. Very right big role. Shout out Hannibal. <laughs> yes. But if you want to shout out to us, where can they find us, Evan? Well, first off, they can find us and support us on our Patreon page. Darn so right you can. We've been talking about this for the last few episodes since we launched it. We do have an official Patreon page, patreon.com slash gems of history podcast. Uh if right now we have one tier of Five membership, nine. do you say? Yeah, I think it's membership. Patronage, if you will. Yes. Um, where we have some cool stuff that we're offering. Uh, check us out on there. Uh, five bucks gets you some really cool things. We'll continue to brainstorm. You know what to do. If we get next to ten thousand patrons, we'll go cross the Alps with elephants. So get us to that point. Uh, yeah, I I, I agree to this. This yeah, is good. It's yeah. in the contract. It is it's a verbal microphone contract exactly (laughs) you can also continue the conversation with us on our facebook we have a discussion group called the agora or you just type in gems of history podcast and you'll most likely find it and then you can find us on twitter at gems underscore history you find jacob at jacob from wisco myself at what evskis and then instagram tiktok and youtube gems of history podcast but yeah uh go say hi to us we like interacting with you guys so poke us on facebook sure <laughs> i don't even know if you can still do that but you know what you guys should do you guys should have a great week and you guys should stay polished because we love you <laughs>